Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I have to say a very warm welcome to everybody here in the audience. So thank you to you, especially that you are here. And together we will share the ultrasound multiparametric approach in oncology. And what does it mean, uh, multiparametric ultrasound? I think that's really clear, focusing, of course, on a good B-mode quality, including color-coded duplex ultrasound for Doppler evaluation, elastography stuff, as well as contrast-enhanced ultrasound. And unique for Canon, uh, of course, SMI as a new brand in um, Doppler technology, and last but not least, Image Fusion, where we can offer the full possibility of ultrasound. And at the ECR meeting, a lot of AI stuff is ongoing. So in my opinion, at the moment, this is a little bit organized chaos, and we will see what happens for ultrasound for the future. This is an example in oncology where we can integrate contrast-enhanced ultrasound as one key feature of multiparametric ultrasound into the so-called Lyrids classification, and that's an example of a focal mass. Uh, we should adapt a protocol for scanning these patients, and this is the official uh, stuff from this Lyrids classification. And now I can show you how it works. And it's very important to understand good B-mode quality at first. Second step is an early timing of the contrast inflow, where we can see a hypervascular lesion after 14 seconds and a clear washout beginning after 60 seconds. And that's important to know because now we have clear this must be an HCC because, for instance, in Scholl angiocellular carcinoma is much earlier as well as a metastasis. So it's very important to have the right timing to analyze, especially the late phase. This is how it looks like in real time, split screen mode, early inflow, highly vascularized, very well depicted with your system so that you have a full and clear view on the lesion itself. And last but not least, you can see here one minute, 37 seconds. We have this clear washout of the lesion, which is very important to define a malignant one. And in that particular case, this should be an HCC after the staging proce procedure or after the Lyrids classification. I think the holy grail of radiology is not ultrasound. It's often MR. But look at this interesting example. This is an overview on CT. We have a single focal lesion. And this is the same position in MR, but we can scan four additional lesions based on MR. So that means MR is superior to CT. But what about ultrasound? Simple B-mode scanning. We can pick up all these four lesions with simple B-mode scanning if you have these nice resolution based on ultrasound. And then, of course, we have additional tools. This is the quad view, where you can have a marker option in the MR scan, in the axial <coughs> positioning. Uh, we can see different sequences, we can have the overlay, and we can have our Doppler possibility. This is an SMI Doppler, and we will understand the highly vascularized nature of the lesion. And of course, if you like, we can reconstruct the SMI in three dimensions to understand it's a basket pattern, highly vascularized, tiny lesion, and sometimes in real time, the uh, second lesion here, focusing hypoechoic, highly vascularized, some necrotic portions. This should be a malignant tumor. And last but not least, we can double check each finding, for instance, the simple cyst, three millimeter in size, and we are able to get in touch with the right position if we use this fusion imaging in our oncological patients. Look at the early contrast inflow, rim-like enhancement, very precise in this situation of a metastasis of a net tumor, and so that we get in touch with all these different possibilities using this high-end equipment. Once again, SMI, we are able to use this together with contrast application. That's also a fancy and funny tool, and you can see here the adaptive sum of the contrast inflow, and no MR, no CT can show images like that. Second step is to correspond also B-mode findings with MR, a single lesion, three millimeters in size, and we are able to pick up these very, very tiny lesions based on ultrasound. What is the ongoing stuff or today, what can we do nowadays? And that's really interesting to you. Um, you can make a decision. There is one FNH and one adenoma on your left and on your right. Any vote? What is the FNH? What is the adenoma? Any idea? OK, no problem. We are in a multi-parametric ultrasound approach session so that we can deal with contrast. FNH, you're right. Perfect. And if this is an FNH and I told you there is some adenoma, this should be the adenoma, yeah? OK, this is what we can do nowadays. But in the future, hopefully, we get images like that. 
And look at this. This is our fancy AI stuff because we can recreate one single image. And the meaning is we can use bubble tracking in, in its high resolution, temporal and spatial resolution. It's very high to understand we have a centralized inflow pattern, a centralized artery to get in touch with the inflow pattern, to visualize one image, and hopefully for the future, a computer will understand this should be the FNH uh, in the same manner like the ultrasound expert. Tyroid nodules. You all know there is an ongoing classification which is named Tyroid's classification, and sometimes this is not easy in our daily routine to use this classification tool. And especially if you deal with the Tyroid's 4 and 5 lesions, we have to use this additional um, key features, solid component, higher stiffness, hypochoic nodule, yes or not, irregular margins, microcalcification, and the important taller than white shape. This is an example of a malignant lesion. We see this tiny calcification, the lesion is stiffer, in strain or she wave elastography, um, both things are available. We have this nice uh, B mode quality. And as an additional tool, once again, this is SMI. Why this is important? I'd like to show you the uh, real time possibility. These are the pathological vessels. That means only this area of the nodule is the carcinoma. And so I think there is an additional value if you use Doppler technology for tyroid nodules, but especially in a setup with SMI in contrast here to a regular based uh, tyroid in that example, or the perfusion of the, of the muscle, which is very well depictable based on SMI Doppler technology. The next, a little bit more uh, in detail, discussion is on uh, ongoing discussion on renal focal lesions. Uh, in my opinion, it's not easy, but we have a lot of renal lesions in our daily routine, and that's why I'd like to focus in a few minutes on this very special topic. This is the overview slide, starting with the introduction, and it's the actual guideline from the contrast-enhanced ultrasound to understand that we have contrast inflow based on ultrasound in the main branches, followed by a fill-in of the segmental, as well as the interlobar arteries and the renal cortex. It takes 15 up to 30 seconds, and then the so-called parenchymal phase, 25 uh, seconds up to four minutes uh, with a decrease of the enhancement, which is very typically for the kidney. This is an example how it looks like. And look at the nice resolution. And we have to understand that we have this typical inflow pattern uh, visualized for the kidneys, and that's important. And one of the key features to separate malignant lesions, for instance, if we have not these precise uh, imaging inflow. This is a regular kidney, so you see it works also on the right flank, where you can use this quad view, where you have the inflow, the B mode, the overlay mode, as well as the arrival time. So a, a lot of possibilities which, is, uh, which are able to use in our daily routine. Coming back to this fill-in pattern, interlobar artery, arcuate artery, cortical arteries. Next step is inflow in the renal cortex no med medullary contrast enhancement, and you can see here the anatomical details. So that means we have a tool which corresponds very well with the anatomical overview, and that's very important to know. And then a fill-in of the pyramids starting from the uh, author contour to the central portion of the pyramids with a much lower flow in contrast to the renal cortex. That's regular anatomy, that's beautiful reconstructed, and once again, of course, a few possibilities dealing with time intensity curve measurements, arrival time, parametric imaging, quantification. So uh, a lot of tools are available for that purpose. The first idea is to use this for renal infarctions or cortical necrosis because this is an absence of vascularity. So it's, that means it's very easy to scan your patients in your daily routine. Interestingly for me, that's an old case, that's an actual case where you can see the value on SMI. You will depict the infarction areas very well. So in some cases we can reduce the contrast application and I think that's also a key feature of SMI. Here you can see the same thing. This is a kidney graft recipient starting with color-coded duplex ultrasound, power Doppler, SMI and contrast. And here in a real-time possibility, SMI uh, in correlation to contrast application, that means we can have a nice visualization of the infarction zone in a good correlation between SMI and contrast application. And if you reconstruct the volume of this zone, we will understand the outcome for the patient, which is an important tool in my daily business. Another example, infarction zone. Here you can see 
in deep located areas, um, the contrast application is superior. Now we have a clear demarcation of the infarction zone, slightly better than an SMI, so there is a clear value to use contrast application for this very special purpose. Another example, BMOD scanning, Doppler evaluation, no findings, and then easily to understand there is a clear infarction. And I think this will become also for the emergency department. If you have a flank pain, a, a young adult, I think it's much better uh, to rule out this infarction zone based on ultrasound and not in a CT scan. Another example, this is cortical necrosis. Looks absolutely different than the infarction zone, but of course this is a severe problem for the patient. This was a young lady, a pregnant lady, with an hemorrhagic shock. And here you can see the cortical necrosis afterwards, so this is a severe problem. And uh, with ultrasound you, will, you are able to get in touch with this pathology. This is a kidney graft recipient with the same thing here. You can see the macroscopic view on the cortical necrosis and the absence of vascularity based on contrast enhanced <coughs> ultrasound. Infarction, bleeding, and hematoma. Look at this. This is conventional ultrasound. And now this is everything together. What does it mean? We can have four different diagnoses in one um, situation. It takes two minutes. Hematoma, active bleeding, exactly, free fluid here, and there was also one AV fistula uh, visible at the beginning of this clip. So that means we are very fast to get in touch with the right diagnosis and this patient underwent immediately to the operation theater. Uh, we can save the life of the kidney graft, so that's very important to know that we have this possibility available. What about pseudotumors for kidneys? I have to go back. Uh, this looks like typically a, a slightly hyperechoic, round-shaped, and if you look at the Doppler, we have normally regular vascular architecture. For double-check contrast application, this is the area of interest, absolutely regular, but we missed this infarction zone. A small infarction zone, which was not visible before. And now, interestingly for me, if we look to the SMI Doppler, we can pick up the same thing in its high quality, and that's really nice. We can use the adaptive sum without contrast media application to understand this must be an infarction zone. And so this is a really helpful uh, tool, in my opinion, for our daily business. Another interesting case, looks like a solid tumor, and this case was staged uh, as Bosniak 2F or 3, that means could be a malignant lesion. And if you look in the ultrasound scan, we see there's a complete absence of vascularity, so that means it's Bosniak 2. And this was a simple stone, and this was definitely no tumor, so we can solve problems, especially in the co-working activity with our MR department to discuss these interesting cases together. And last but not least, for the uh, demo with our urological colleagues, uh, these are nice images where you understand there is a vascularization, but not in that area of the stone. This is not longer a solid problem. Uh, this is absolutely um, no problem for this special patient. Looks quite similar, but this is a horrible situation because this is three days after um, a kidney graft. So that, that means uh, we can picking up a lesion and the patient asked me, so Professor Fischer, is this a problem, yes or not? So I was able to get my um, phone and call the uh, surgeon, but he was uh, under vacation. So that was a horrible scenario. So the idea was to use contrast. And look at this, after 14 seconds, I can say everything's okay. There's a complete absence of vascularity. Whatever happens, it's no problem to you. And I get in touch with this 3D reconstruction, nice images, and f uh, five days later, the surgeon told me, Thomas, this was a sclerosing cyst, so everything is fine, good news for the patient, and of course, uh, a good case for me. So that means we have to deal with complex cystic renal masses, including a Bosnia classification. And this is how it looks like. And ultrasound is an ideal tool to make a decision between one and two, that means ignore, and three and four, that means excise. 
And the major problem is the 2F category for these cystic lesions in our oncological patients. And so therefore, we use a lot of contrast application. How it works? This is a multi-center study published at the ECR last year. And you can see here a perfect correlation between contrast-enhanced ultrasound and CT, which is the gold standard for this classification. You see a spearman rock correlation of 0.937. That means very high and good correlation. But look at this. That's very clear. That's our important category, 2F. There's the major problem. Do you know why we have this problem with this category? It's very easy to understand because we can see more things like the CT scan because we have an enhancement of these septic areas. And the Bosnak classification was adapted to CT. So that means in category 2F, there is an absence of enhancement. So that's why we have to describe this in our written report. That's totally different from CT in this category. So that's why uh, we have often trouble to correlate uh, the 2F category with CT. So that's very important to know. And interestingly, you see um, uh, the correlation between contrast-enhanced ultrasound and MR is not as good as the correlation with CT. Some cases, that's clear, Bosniak 1, normally you don't need contrast application, but only to demonstrate the value, complete absence here on vascularity. Bosniak 2, yeah, cystic lesion, there is a septic area. Hopefully for the future, we can use this artificial intelligence to analyze the volume. That means if the patient comes back, you can follow him. You have the volumetric access, and you see different layers, different levels of these complex cysts. I think that's an ideal tool for follow-up of our patients. Very, very helpful and easily, so you don't have to measure by yourself. Uh, this should be done by a computer, a real stuff for artificial intelligence. Interesting case, hemorrhagic cyst. Uh, once again, classified as Bosniak 2F from the CT because we have higher Hounsfield units here in that example. And now using image fusion, it's simple to have a marker point here. And then we can see clearly in this 5 millimeter lesion, there is no contrast available. That means it's a simple cyst, hemorrhagic cyst, Bosniak 2, no problem for the patient. A little bit more examples on your left. This is once again a hemorrhagic cyst, correlation of these tiny lesions between MR and ultrasound. And on your right, a tiny renal cell or small renal cell carcinoma. And we see a lot of bubble inflow. That means this is malignant, that not. So in these tiny lesions, we are often see from MR. That's also once again a very helpful multi parametric approach dealing with contrast application. Another interesting case, the horseshoe kidney. That's your CT, that's ultrasound, and here you can see the value on BMOD scanning. We see the, all these septic areas very nicely, which are not very well depictable based on your CT scan. Next step is contrast inflow, contrast in the A order, contrast in the kidney. Then we have a lot of contrast in these septic areas, and it takes a few seconds um, to have contrast in the vena cava now. So we can see very nicely the value on contrast enhanced ultrasound in that case. And this is a feeling of Captain Kirk to fly through these septic areas. Uh, is this helpful? Absolutely not. But it's nice to demonstrate this case to your colleagues. And I think it's a little bit of a kind of show to have this septic enhancement available in three dimensions. Of course, we can use this technology also to follow up patients. This is a small renal cell carcinoma. And now we follow up the size because this patient is uh, um, 82 years old. So we don't do anything. We make only watchful waiting strategy in that example. You see this um, highly vascularized lesion here, very small one, and we have to wait. And um, this is also a possibility to get in touch with the image fusion stuff. So to conclude this part of the talk, um, I think for cystic lesions, Bosnia classification for soy is comparable to our gold standard, which is the mm -hmm. CT. And we have a wide range of mismatches uh, with MR, especially in this category. And that's based on different enhancement pattern. And I think we should use this term uh, in our written report that we have uh, the application of contrast enhanced ultrasound in these complex renal cysts. But once again, we need of experienced investigators, and that's why you are here. So I'm happy that you are here, um, that we can talk together and uh, go more in detail uh, with this very important stuff. But what about solid renal lesions? 
It's a little bit more different. And um, I love this overview here on um, this nice uh, web page where you can separate, first of all, a bulk type or a beam type lesion. And that's an example for you in the B-mode scan. We have to know that the clear cell renal cell carcinoma is um, around about 70% of all renal cell carcinomas. That means we have a hypervascular lesion, we have a heterogeneous one, including necrosis, cystic lesions or calcifications. And sometimes we see also extracellular fat, especially in the MR evaluation. And that's an example to demonstrate that we can see the same things in CT and ultrasound. looks quite similar here. Um, the early enhancement phase of this very well vascularized clear cell renal cell carcinoma. This is an interesting case. This is an incidental finding in a young man. We have this hyperechoic lesion. You see here a bulb type lesion, and then we have contrast inflow in the lesion, and we have a washout later on. And if you go in this schema, uh, we can see the most relevant diagnosis is papillary um, carcinoma. And uh, that's also the histological finding. And now I show you the inflow pattern. There's a delayed inflow, which is often very typically for this lesion. And on your right, we have this washout. You see two minutes, 58 seconds after contrast application, uh, which is very typically for this papillary renal cell carcinoma. And of course, you can measure all these things in the time intensity curve measurement stuff. This is really a rare case of a mass uh, in a kidney graft. This is a medullary cell carcinoma. And interestingly, we can see the same thing. This is MR, this is ultrasound. We see this lower enhancement pattern, which is often typical for these two types of lesions. So if you have a lower contrast inflow, this is not related to a clear cell carcinoma. This is often visible in these medullary cell carcinomas. Otherwise, this is often a very homogeneous tumor, uh, which is not easy to picking up these tumors for ultrasound. What is your differential diagnosis? You can see I have different ones. Angiomyelipoma, oncocytoma, uh, renal cell carcinoma. That's the kidney, and that's the bulb type lesion. Any idea? It's not easy, right? Starting first with SMI. Why this is helpful? You can see all these AV shans, which is very typically for that lesion. Next step, to deal with contrast application. Now you can see the inflow is at the same timing of the renal cortex, homogeneous inflow. We have one centralized artery. I can use this also in addition here with the arrival time. You say this is the same arrival time like the renal cortex. At the final end, this was a minimal fat AML. That's why this was hypoechoic for ultrasound. And of course, we have to double check these findings with MR. And um, we have the exclusion of this uh, tumor and this was indeed a minimal fat angiomyelipoma. Another interesting case, um, from my daily business, the differential diagnosis <laughs> between a renal cell carcinoma of the clear cell type and an oncocytoma is often very difficult. That's an example how it works. Once again, image fusion, CT ultrasound. The next key feature is SMI in the fusion mode, highly vascularized. And next step is contrast inflow. You see this is a rim-like enhancement pattern. It's nearly isoechoic to the surrounding uh, tissue. But if you look very carefully, we can see some tiny cystic or necrotic portions of the tumor. And once again, if we use SMI, we can visualize this much better. And this was a renal cell carcinoma of a clear cell type. Another interesting case with a differential diagnosis. This was misinterpreted uh, as a lesion, but if we use contrast, we get the full story. We have the lesion here, we have a rim-like enhancement, and we have an effect on the renal cortex, which is also visible in the MR scan. And of course, this is an abscess, um, and there was a chronic pyelonephritis before. Um, so that means we have a tool uh, as a problem solver if we use this in addition with fusion, with contrast, and SMI. 
Sometimes we have very difficult cases. This is a clear renal cell carcinoma, of course, that's clear. Um, but you see there's a thrombus here in the uh, renal vein. And the next question is, you see this is not a perfect uh, timing on a CT bolus administration. Is there also an additional thrombus in the vena cava? And therefore we used ultrasound and you see this flapping thrombus. This is a tumor thrombus. Why we can say this? Because we have some bubbles inside. So that means that's definitely could not be a regular thrombus. This should be a tumor thrombus. So I think that's a very important tool um, to use this. Uh, and you see here the flapping here of the tumor thrombus very well in the <coughs> renal cava. So some tips and tricks. If you deal with the kidneys, I think it's very important with your high-end system to reduce the dose. Sometimes 0.6 um, milliliter are enough, especially if you deal with these tiny septic uh, lesions or uh, cysts. So this is, I think, very important. Um, 2F classification uh, is different between CT and contrast application uh, in terms of the visibility of the vascular enhancement pattern. And I think especially the new Doppler technology SMI is very, very helpful to get in touch with the real architecture of these lesions. And um, so once again, the last point, vascular architecture plays a role and make your decision or differential diagnosis, in my opinion. Some cases to you. So after half an hour, hopefully your brain is uh, fit, everything is good. Yeah? Okay, so starting the first case. And what is your Bosnia classification? Two? two? Three. So you see the problem between two and three. Okay, what we can see, we can see a septic enhancement also there. Next case. Oh, I, I have to go back. <laughs> too fast. Um, this was 2F classified. Uh, we staged this patient over the last three years with, without any changes. So if you can say 2F, I think this was the right decision. Case two. What should we do next? Or should we do nothing? <coughs> of course. Very good. You are in the right session. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I give you the contrast application. Simple cyst? No, you see the overlay. Contrast inside, unbelievable. And look at this. What is your diagnosis? Papillary renal cell carcinoma. And this is often also a problem for CT, not only for ultrasound, because these tumors are very homogeneous. That's why they are very hypoechoic. And you have to play with your gain, otherwise you miss this lesion and you will uh, see it looks like a simple cyst, like in that example here. But if you um, use your contrast stuff, you will see there's a lot of contrast inside. And um, so therefore, this is a problem solver in these very special cases. Case three. I give you first the SMI and then the contrast application. What is your feeling? Look at the, the B mode, contrast, SMI. It's not so easy because once again, this is a chronic abscess. You have some vascularity and you, you see also there is a vascularity in the surrounding tissue because this is affected. And of course, you have to know also the history of the patient. Otherwise, you, you will miss if you use only the contrast application. You are right. And interestingly, in contrast, this case, I love this case to see the value on SMI because now you can see the um, typically vascular pattern, rim shape, we have uh, bigger vessels, smaller vessels, we have arrows. That means that's clearly a pathological uh, architecture. So this is your renal cell carcinoma in contrast to the abscess before. And once again, contrast application of the same case. Rim-like enhancement, same arrival time like the renal cortex and the central necrosis, which is often very typically for this clear cell carcinoma. So the funny thing is, a little bit smaller, testicular lesion. So uh, can we use also this multipyramidic approach for these kind of lesions? And if you look once again in the guidelines, there are some recommendations to use contrast-enhanced ultrasound for small focal testicular lesions, 
for non-viable tissue after trauma. We have a lot of football players in Berlin, so I think that's important to know. Um, or a segmental infarction or for small abscesses. How it looks like, you see this was a severe infection and you see this destruction of the testicular uh, tissue and which is easily to uh, visualize based on contrast enhanced ultrasound and of course to follow up these uh, patients very carefully. Another example of a very small abscess in the scrotal wall here, an abscess in a range of five millimeters. We see this typically enhancement pattern of an abscess with this rim-like enhancement in an acute stage and of course uh, the missing of, of bubbles in the central portion of this area and this was misinterpreted before as a tumor but this is a severe infection of course. Are we able to make a decision between malignant and benign lesions in the testis? What is your opinion? Is this possible? Okay, look at this. The left side, three examples of typically benign lesions. The right side, typical example of malignant lesions. It's not easy to handle this topic, but if you look at the vascularity, often we see tiny lesions, hypervascular lesions, regular uh, vascular architecture in, in these benign lesions in contrast to um, burnout tumors with this ma macrocalcification, absence of vascularity, melanoma metastasis, chaotic vascular architecture, and seminoma, totally um, chaotic vascular architecture. So that means, if we look at this, this is a rare case of a hemangioma. Looks like an FNH of the liver, but we have totally irregular vascular architecture. And on your right, this is the seminoma. Look at these tiny vessels. We have this fancy tool that looks like a histological specimen. So that means we are able to get in touch with this topic uh, if we deal with vascular architecture as well as with contrast inflow pattern. So we have to have a mixture of different uh, techniques, in my opinion, to get in touch with this topic. And once again, the arrival time where we can see perfect here the necrosis of the tumor, these chaotic vessels, these different arrival times here. That means everything is possible. So if you look in the literature, it's the same like in your audience. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. That's exactly the view at the moment. That's the current status of publication. But I think um, we should integrate all these fancy stuff of, stuff of our multi approach to get in touch with this very special topic. And for our patients, you see an example of a uh, so-called lytic cell tumor uh, where we have an organ sparing surgery. We exclude the tumor and the diagnosis was done before. And of course, we have to correlate this with, a, um, with an analysis um, of, the, of this tumor uh, after the operation. Uh, but this works very well, in my opinion. Prostate cancer, ladies and gentlemen. This is the same like breast cancer. This is a huge topic or in, in focus nowadays. And what can we do? Uh, I'm not sure if you are all experts in the field of prostate cancer detection. So I will give you a complete overview on the whole topic so that you can have your own experience with this topic, OK? Starting with this introduction. So first, we have to say prostate cancer is the most common malignancy in men with a clear increasing incidence. And if you look at the roadmap, you will see there's a difference between Asia and the European countries or the Western civilization itself. So, but it's a question of time, uh, of course, based on the lifestyle uh, where we get you all on this map. And so I think this was from 2012. And if we have an actual map, we will see a different color, in my opinion. And that's exactly the problem. So huge of number of patients um, with this problem. I love this image. Why? This is a pioneer of ultrasound. This is Mr. Watanabe. He is sitting uh, on his own transrectal ultrasound chair. And now the good news, he's getting his own prostate. That's why I can tell you this is a pioneer of ultrasound, okay? And on your right, this is how it looks like nowadays. This is T2-weighted MR imaging. This is diffusion-weighted imaging. This is contrast inflow. And why we have some additional informations, you see that the tumor is bigger than expected from the MR. And now we are easily in the position to picking up this tumor based on ultrasound and to do all our strategies to understand the value on image fusion, uh, especially for this purpose. 
Um, if you do things like that, um, we have to use different equipment. This is a so-called biplane probe, often used by urologists. This is an endfire probe. All these images um, are done with this endfire probe, with this um, nice and fancy evaluation of contrast, cheery philosophy, and so on. And this is a therapeutic probe that you understand there's different shape of different transducers uh, with this topic. Typical biplane situation for the urologist, a tumor in two views, that's normally. And that's your end fire probe with better visualization of the needle or the needle tip, which is, of course, important if you deal with the topic of image fusion. That is a, it's a basic principle, and the understanding is very important. Go to the anatomy of the prostate. Um, that's an MR scan of a young adult, so every, everything is okay. So, and you have to know that most of the tumors are localized in the peripheral zone. And if we compare this peripheral zone with MR and ultrasound, so it matched perfect, so that means peripheral zone is no problem. We uh, can picking up these easily. It's um, more important to understand the central zone and transition zone. It's more difficult for ultrasound to separate. And then we have also the fibromuscular stroma, uh, which should not be um, uh, as uh, expected as a tumor. Sometimes this is not easy because often this looks like hypoechoic because this is full um, of fibromuscular tissue. And this is how it looks like in older men. This is a typical BPH nodule. You see the peripheral zone is very small and we have this huge BPH nodule and normally um, the prostate of a young adult is in a range of a chestnut and this guy has, uh, let me say, an apple zine or something as a little bit bigger. And sometimes uh, this guy has a handball, so it could be huge. What are the recommendations from the guidelines so far? We have to uh, do a 10 or 12 core sampling uh, if we have a clear suspicion for a prostate cancer and how it works in our department. Normally we do oral antibiotics before, then we uh, use uh, local anesthesia like in that example. And the next step is um, to deal with this randomized or so-called randomized biopsy, um, 10 up to 12 core sampling for each patient. Of course, this is painful and in my opinion, not the best strategy. And this is a real clinical case. This is how it looks like. B-mode scan, axial, sagittal view, volumetric measurement, prostate is enlarged, and that's the history of the patient, 72 years old, two negative biopsies before, and a really high PSA level. So that means there must be a cancer inside, but you see it's, it's very difficult. So first of all, we use our schema, do a 10-core sampling, and the problem is no cancer was detected. That's the reality in most of the European countries. And what is the problem with this technology? You can see if the tumor is located in a ventral or anterior position, we miss this tumor, or we have an incidental finding of a low-grade cancer, but the aggressive cancer is missed, or we have an aggressive cancer, but the aggressive portion of the tumor is located in a different position. So that all, um, all these things focusing that we have an uh, undergrading of prostate cancer by the so-called Gleason score of 36 up to 46%, and that's why this guy from the Netherlands told us we have to scan each patient in MR. That's a good news for all radiologists because now the patients get in touch more and more with MR evaluation for the detection. But then, of course, we have to use ultrasound to make a target biopsy, which is absolutely important. And now we have the right stuff to do this. MR ultrasound image fusion is the key feature um, to handle this problem. Oh, I love this image very much because that's the best overview to understand the problem with prostate cancer. You have to pick up the wolf between all the sheep, And that's exactly the problem in our daily routine. Okay, next step. Everything now is clear, nice B mode, but where's the tumor? What should we do? We should do an MR first. T2 weighted imaging. Everything is clear? No, not. MRs also in multi-parametric approach. So they use diffusion imaging or dynamic MR. And is ultrasound worse? What can we do? Look at this. This is a simple power Doppler. The right side is hypervascularized or elastography. This is an example of tissue Doppler imaging. And last but not least, contrast enhanced ultrasound where we see this earlier inflow in the tumor area. The problem with this is that we have only one second to get in touch with this. This is our image fusion biopsy, and that's our result, that's the tumor. 
And that's the contrast inflow, that's the tumor, central zone, and now contrast in the peripheral zone. You see it takes one up to two seconds um, to have this uh, signal enhancement. And if you don't have the right scan plane, we will miss this tumor. And that's why we focusing on image fusion. It's much easier to visualize the tumor and to do this. How it works. And I love to explain this, how it works. This is Smurfette. Yeah, and Smurfette is a beautiful lady with blonde hair. And by the way, that's the only lady in the story of the Smurfs. And there is a bad guy in the story which is named Gargamel. And his idea was to use this girl to lure all the other Smurfs. Sounds to me like the real life, in my opinion. Yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I can say I'm not interested only in blonde hair girls. So. And what can we do with ultrasound nowadays? Look at this sensor 3D, 18 megahertz. Is this beautiful or very beautiful? Smurfette is four centimeters, so this is perfect. And the next step is to use the volumetric scanning based on CT. It's also not so bad from the same company, by the way. And then look at this. Smurfette has a typical landmark, and now you can fix your landmark. That's your CT scan, that's your ultrasound scan. Here you can see the volumetric measurement based on CT. So that's why we are able to picking up tiny lesions based on this landmark evaluation. And now all of you know I'm also a kind of smurf, yeah? And for me, you, the message is uh, sometimes you have to use the, use the right equipment. And that's why I can say I'm not only a smurf, I'm also a German smurf to drink a lot of beer, right? But if you have a beard, you need the right equipment and it's absolutely or nearly the same with ultrasound. But ladies and gentlemen, by the way, let us return to this clinical case, yeah? And here you can see the problem. Here's the tumor, very small one, but a very aggressive one. And we miss this tumor by our regular sampling. And um, this is our setup. You see, we deal with a target biopsy, 10 core sampling plus two additional target biopsies. And this is how it looks like. Here you can see the tumor in MR. This is the same scan plane in ultrasound. And then the needle tip is coming and we are perfectly aligned to the tumor area so it works. And then we get in touch with the right diagnosis. So the overall story is with increased detection of high-risk prostate cancers and a decreased detection of low-risk prostate cancers. That's the key feature on these targeting procedures. And uh, I can fully agree with the author of, of uh, this publication. That's exactly the, the future on, on this purpose. Um, this is an uh, activity or an running out from our department. You see a huge of numbers of patients, more than 400. And you can see our overall detection rate in a setup or in a patient collective where we have two negative biopsies before, 56%. It's nearly the same like the MR inbore biopsy result. And so that means, yes, we can say it works. And you see, first of all, you need the good MR stuff. You need the pirates classification. And to solve the problems, we deal with the image fusion or targeting biopsy. And this setup, based on the pirates classification, which is very important. And by the way, interestingly for me, the dynamic contrast enhanced MR plays only a rule to make a decision in um, Pirates category three, yes or not, to downgrade or upgrade your lesion. And I think that's a good uh, space also for contrast application in ultrasound if you have all these things available. Why? Because we have to reduce the scanner time if we talk on screening program for these patients. So I think that's a perfect interactive um, tool or approach to work um, in co-working activities with ultrasound and CT. A lot of facts, but by the way, only for me, in, in our study, we missed only one case if we deal with all these multiparametric imaging, in contrast to three cases if we deal only with B-mode alone. That's important in a huge number of patients, in my opinion. So that's why I can say that the highest sensitivity was observed for contrast application in this setup, but there's also a value on elastography. 80% is not so bad sensitivity to picking up all these tiny lesions, uh, once again, in a collective of patients with more than two negative biopsies in the history. We have some new fancy stuff, and um, we can have a 3D reconstruction of SMI, a rival time parametric imaging, time intensity curve measurement. And if you look very carefully on this video clip, you will understand this is the purple curve. 
typically for a cancer, aggressive <coughs> one. And the blue curve, this is the low-grade cancer. So, of course, we have to know that in prostate cancer we have always a multifocal disease, and that's why this technology is helpful if you deal with things like focal therapy of the prostate. Uh, so this is the basic principle to have a um, severe diagnosis of your patients. And um, I'm really lucky that I have uh, Professor Jung here in the audience because he's one of the co-workers uh, of this nice um, publication. Uh, he was the guy who analyzed, blinded all these um, contrast enhance flow, enhancement flow uh, things and video clips. So, uh, Micha, thank you so much for your help. Yeah, thank you that you are here. And um, I think we can say we are able with this subgroup analysis to use peak enhancement, wash in and wash out rate to have a statistically significance to separate aggressive cancers from non-aggressive ones. And that's very interesting and important. And of course, this is a more scientific research, but I think this is very important to know. Some other nice pictures, quad screen, arrival time, uh, different um, MR um, sequences, contrast inflow. So that means everything is possible. And by the way, we can recreate different scan planes, corona, sagittal, axial, um, also the puncture procedure. And that works not only for prostate, that works, of course, for liver lesion, for everything, for our uh, well, picking up our tumors. But prostate is once again a very small organ. And I can say, as an interventional radiologist, if this works on prostate, it works definitely on liver. Here, once again, the beautiful contrast inflow on this aggressive cancer. And you will understand the value on this technology to be sure that you are right and plain and that we have this early enhancement pattern, which is often typically for these aggressive uh, cancers. What is the benefit? And the benefit is um, all these things focusing um, more and more in focal therapy of organs. And uh, in our department, we use the new central operation theater together with the urology department, and we used a uh, irreversible electroporation. This is a publication of the basic principle. If you like, you can read this paper. Why are we focusing on this therapy? You can see here, this is an example of an animal liver, and you will see day one after therapy, it looks like a necrosis, but on day 14, there's absolutely nothing. And that's why we can say we have to use this, because we have a certain selectivity for soft tissue, such as tumor cells, while it is least lethal for nerves, fibrotic tissue, and vessels. And that's why we're focusing on this topic for prostate. And this is a short video clip how um, this works. By the way, many thanks to Nadim from Canon. He's very, very helpful for this purpose. You see, first of all, the insertion of the probe. And this is the, uh, these are the hands of the urologist. Then the view on the ultrasound scanner, a catheter in the bladder. And then we uh, have a scan to the whole prostate. We discuss everything together on the screen using our ultrasound platform. And interestingly for me, you can see also the SMI Doppler is very, very helpful to adapt the area of interest in this very tiny lesion, which is our um, focal target. And then we can start our interaction with the first needle. And it's the same like the image fusion biopsy, so that means we can use our MR uh, scan. We can handle this. You see this tiny focal lesion. And the next step is to use MR for the whole procedure. This is how it looks like, tiny lesion. Next step, MR ultrasound correlation different modes, then we have this grid where you can see, okay, now place your needle in C2 or B1 or whatever. It's much easier to have the discussion with the urologist. Um, once again, the diffusion weighted imaging, the small tumor and four additional needles in the surrounding tissue of the tumor. The needle tips are very well depictable based on B-mode ultrasound. Second scan play, linear transducer, you see exactly the area of interest uh, with this mode then switch back into the axial scan plane and then you can start immediately your procedure. You have to control the perfusion of the rectal wall, which is um, in, in that example uh, correct. And then we have this um, gas formation here in the area of the tumor. 
Last but not least, we can use elastography in addition because now we can see the softening of the tumor if the therapy works. Then we can have this three-dimensional reconstruction of the defect of the tumor. And I'd like to show you this nice video clip, the tumor area before, SMI Doppler directly in the operation theater. And next step is to see this huge perf perfusion defect. That means we can ablate half of the prostate, the tumor, or the whole gland. So everything is possible with this technology. And of course, this is work in progress. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we are absolutely in time. Image Fusion offers the possibility of uh, real-time ultrasound with contrast-enhanced ultrasound for the detection, characterization, and treatment monitoring of different cancers, including prostate cancer. We can confirm tumor aggressiveness, by the way. And I think, interestingly for me, contrast-enhanced ultrasound has the highest sensitivity in this setup. Um, the testicular lesion, the problem of misinterpretation can result in unnecessary orchiectomy and the differentiation between hypervascular and airvascular lesions, benign and malignant, um, is very, very important. The conclusion for cysts, you have seen this. Once again, for all these things, we need experienced experts. That's why we have special training programs and uh, that's very, very important to get in touch with this nice, fancy, high-end stuff. You can see ultrasound is directly in my heart and I have to say thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you.